Thank you for joining me today. I'm Andrew Hogan, the CMO and co-founder of Intorca. I'm going to be talking about tackling cheating in gaming. And whilst it might not surprise you that I'm going to be telling you how important it is that we do tackle the problem of cheating, um, it may surprise you that I'm going to tell you the way to do this is by looking at how we find cheats. And that, that is the key to it. So we set up Intorca about just over a year ago. Um, with a kind of a promise of making gaming safer and fairer. And this is supported by three key objectives. The first of these was to find and stop more cheats. The second, to save time and money doing so. And the third, to protect the player experience. Now, I'm sure those, those objectives, those aims will be talked about a lot over the, over the, you know, the period of this, of this summit. And I, yeah, I think that's, a, that's obviously a very good thing. And, you know, you'd think these are pretty unarguable. But the one thing that's surprised us a little bit since we launched in Talker was that there still seems to be, or maybe not still seems, but there is, there does seem to be now a bit, almost a sense of resignation about cheating amongst some people in the industry, almost a feeling that it's just a cost of doing business. And there's, there's, just, not a, there's just not much we can do about it. So you can imagine how pleased we were to see um, cheating featured in the Fair Play Alliance framework alongside issues like dangerous speech, extremism, aggravation and harassment, because it needs to be, because that is exactly what it is, a disruptive behaviour in gaming. Now, the other thing that we were pleased to see was how the definition of cheating use was broader than it sometimes is. So it's defined as exploiting the rules of the game to gain an advantage or disrupt play. This includes individual cheating and leveraging AI to cheat at scale. And then examples given included all the usual ones like bots, you know, the aim bots, wall hacks and GPS bots, but also talked about manual and automated farming, leveling, boosting, net code, loot and item finders um, and data scraping. And I think this is really important because it's no good just looking at a little, you know, one particular niche um, in the sort of, if, if you like, in the business of cheating. The whole, the whole piece needs to be looked at because it's also very much linked. We ran a poll um, just over a year ago, I'd say, amongst 2,000 gamers. And we asked them, what would make you stop playing a video game first? And we had various rounds. Um, and the final was between these four. Slow loading speed, too many cheats, toxicity amongst players, and a lack of player support. Now, you can see that toxicity came out as the, the biggest driver of people, you know, putting their... Putting their, putting their mouse down and leaving a game. But cheating was pretty close behind it. And both of these were way ahead uh, of slow loading speed and lack of player support, which were the third and fourth biggest reasons. So that really does, I think, demonstrate how big an issue cheating is. It's also worth just highlighting here that the 2,000 players that we talked to, they were not just PC players. These, they, we, didn't, we went into this quite agnostic, actually. And, you know, they were people who played all games on any sort of on all sorts of consoles so they were there were pc gamers there there were console gamers and there were mobile gamers um and i think that's really important because you know cheating just as gaming is evolved just as gaming evolves so does cheating um and, and some and that sometimes it kind of evolves quicker as well so i guess that you know in a way the first question this 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 throws up if you like is well how bad is it so at first glance, and if you just look, go by some of the headlines, you know, we all have seen in the game, in the game's press and things, you know, it might not be so bad. The industry might be getting a hold of it quite nicely, quite well, I should say. Activision have announced, announced back in February that Warzone banned 60,000 cheaters in one massive wave. And actually that's been followed up recently with an announcement from Raven Software, who talked about half a million um, accounts being banned since the launch of Warzone. No, that's accounts and not players. And that's quite important because obviously cheats will use multiple accounts. So you'll always have more accounts banned than you will players. Um, but still, you know, absolutely um, great, great to see. And then, of course, a couple of months later, there was the bust in Kunchen, China, um, which it didn't just wasn't just featured in the gaming press. I mean, it was it was all, it was all, it was all over the main it was all over the mainstream news. Um, and was, you know, this gang was 
reputedly, I think, responsible for something like $75 million worth of cheats being sold, um, caught in a massive police sting. And, you know, in that, in all the reporting of it, they featured this shot of the kind of ill-gotten gains, um, in this case, luxury cars that the gang had um, managed to acquire, um, which is, which obviously is great. It makes it a great news story. But um, interestingly, what it reminded me of um, is actually my favorite TV program, which was The Wire. It is The Wire. Now, for those of you who um, are also fans who have seen The Wire, you'll recognize Bunk and McNulty there, um, two of the main protagonists in the, in the show. Um, and Bunk and McNulty would spend loads of time pushing back against their seniors and um, you know the politicians who would constantly be asking for loads of low-level busts to take place to give them their drugs on the table photo opportunities. And um, Bunk and McNulty would always kind of push back against this and try and convince them that there's no point doing that because it just gives the you know, the gangs higher up the chance to kind of get away, if you like. And, you know, they knew that all these, all these photo opportunities and drugs on the table busts, they didn't really add up to much because there would still be loads of, you know, drug trafficking going on. There would still be lots of dealers out there. And, you know, it's not a perfect analogy, but it did remind me when I saw the when I saw the clinician bus, it did sort of remind me of it because um, you know, just as there were loads of dealers left out there, there are loads of cheats, and in particular, loads of cheat sellers out there, as any um, you know, as any gamer will tell you. At the moment, we're monitoring um over 150 different cheat sellers. And, you know, that's obviously a lot, but, you know, we are under no illusion that um, that's all of them. We, I, I, I would expect that number to double over the next six months or so. There are so many more cheat sellers out there than people realise. Um, and, you know, and uh, that for me is just a great, you know, proof point, if you like, of the extent of cheating, go, the, the extent of cheating that's going on out there. I think it's also worth noting that that is being driven by the fact that cheating is no longer PC only um and that it's a it's a it's across the board now and that you know you'll find cheats on pretty much um any game you come across <laughs> even else is at it um and whilst it's you know it's sort of easy to smile at the thought of a frozen as something as innocent as frozen being cheated being pirated you know this actually um raises a serious problem because as bad as cheating is when it's affecting the player experience in a sort of in a, in a big multiplayer, um, and that is terrible in, in the long term, will um, damage a game's credibility and its kind of you know success. Um, this sort of cheating directly attacks the business model um, that many developers rely on, i.e., in-app purchases and ad revenue. Now, like you know, we, you might not, you, we may not like ads in our games and stuff, but developers, you know, some developers will be relying on that. And these um, these sites, which are offering you know modified versions of the games with with unlimited unlimited gems or ad blocking, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are directly basically directly attacking attacking that business model. So it's a really serious um, issue. And um, what I wanted to do now is just talk about um, some of the reasons why you know effectively we've got to this place. Um, you know, how have we let it get so bad? So the first one of those reasons um, is around it's the kind of obvious place to start, I guess, is the rise of online gaming, in particular the free-to-play games. There's no doubt that that has coincided with a rise in cheating and has driven a rise in cheating. But as well as the sort of, if you like, just the sort of hard numbers, I think what's particularly damaging about this is that this cheating often takes place in games like Battle Royale games, where if someone is cheating, they're seen to be cheating by loads of players in that game, um, who will obviously then go and talk about it and complain about it on social media and stuff. You know, they're not just cheating one other person, they're cheating a group of people. And this kind of magnifies the problem, this just kind of makes the problem seem even bigger than it even is. Um, and, you know, and the real sort of, um, I think the real problem with that is that this encourages a kind of attitude of if you can't beat them, join them. You know, if you see everyone around you cheating, you, you know, lots of people will eventually just say, you know what, this is unfair. I want to, frankly, 
I want to level, level things up. I want, to, I want to have the same advantages that they have. And this is exactly what happened with cheating in traditional sports. And it's without a doubt it's happening in this sort of, particularly in this kind of area of gaming. And, it, you know, that's a, re- and that's, a real, that's a real issue. It's also, to an extent, I think, reflected by um, some attitudes in the business itself, where you do come across a bit of a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, head in the sand kind of stance to cheating in that it's just kind of it's just one of those things that's just it's going to always be there just best left alone and actually i think this is brought to life by if you look at the media coverage given to cheating in comparison to the media coverage given to i don't know sort of merger m a's and investment and um sponsorships which get tons and tons of coverage you can't every day there's a new m and every day there's a new um multi-million investment in a developer every day there's a brand that's kind of now sponsoring um an esports team or an esports event but actually stories about cheating are pretty rare actually you know apart from the kind of recent sort of apart from actually apart from those two stories i've kind of featured there's not been much there isn't much and i think in a way it's great that those positive stories get so much coverage but we need to be we need to be realistic and honest um because if we don't get at grip on cheating, those positive stories will dry up because sponsors, particularly non-endemic sponsors like Coke and P&G and people, they ain't going to want to be associating their brands with, with you know, sports or, you know, gaming um, events which are in, inundated with cheating. It's just not good for them. It's, it's become, it becomes toxic. And so it really does, you know, we, we, we need to sort of, um, you know, be mindful of this. The third reason that cheating is kind of as established as it is now, I think comes down to the third parties. Um, The third parties, which in effect, unknowingly maybe, but support the cheating ecosystem. You know, the cheating ecosystem needs payment functionality. It needs to be able to market. It needs security. And because, you know, cheating sites are like any other digital, sorry, any, any other online retailer, they need trust. So they go to the big brands for it because they want to have a big PayPal logo on their site because it's going to make someone feel that much more comfortable inputting their credit card details when they're buying a cheat or when they're subscribing to a, a cheat service. Likewise, you know, being seen to be advertising on YouTube makes them almost seem proper. Um, and then, you know, have, have it, making the site seem as secure and stuff, particularly the, sort of the rumors that you get around some cheat sites. It's, it's, it's ironic, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's obviously also, frustrating when you see these brands on their sites they don't they you know i'm sure most of them that they are unaware of it but the cheat sites are making the most out of those those business relationships now the good news is this actually does offer an opportunity i think um or or which i'll come and talk about a bit later but another an opportunity for how we can potentially disrupt the cheating or one way we can potentially disrupt the cheating ecosystem next is the I suppose the history of cheating um, and specifically the history of um, attitudes towards cheating, because cheating didn't always seem so bad. It wasn't always frowned upon. Um, it was kind of seen as a, as a genuinely integral part of gaming. You know, when, when, you, when you watch these documentaries about the history of gaming and you see people talking about the first arcade games, I mean, inevitably they'll start talking about how they used to hack them um, to make them actually, ironically enough, to make them harder. Uh, because those arcade games are pretty simple and were quite if you play if you spend enough if you put enough money into it and played it enough you'd eventually beat it um so hackers would work out how to make it more difficult and then obviously also pro you know and developers also use cheating for play testing and things um and this picture brings to life hackers were sort of heroes in kids films um now this is obviously before um hacking and cheating became um a multi-million dollar industry um occasionally with links to crime but it does bring to life how things have changed or have they because actually there is still what i call sort of mixed opinions around um how bad cheating is and how we should um if you like react to it um i'm going to show you some uh posts from reddit um that we saw which were about a month or so after the, the, the bust in china that we just looked at and it had featured people talking about it. Um, and I'll just read these out to you because it's kind of, it does bring to life the fact that there's different opinions. 
So firstly, I can't believe that cheats and hacks for games are now criminal offences. What is this world coming to? It is the end of times. Like OP said, if you read the article, it's not the cheaters getting arrested. It's the organization making tens of millions selling cheats and hacks to subscribers. It's always about money. When players are paying for hacks instead of loot boxes, that's when big business brings out the dogs. Just because they're making millions doesn't mean they deserve jail time. Cheating in a video game doesn't actually hurt anyone. Calling them a gang is pretty ridiculous. People should be able to modify any software that runs on their computer by default. I don't think you read the article. They weren't just cheating. They were selling cheats on a subscription basis for multiplayer games. So should people be able to modify that software if the intent of the software is to be played with other people using the same software, <sighs> creating an equal playing ground? What if they compete and win money over people with unmodified copies? We're talking about actual real jail for cheating at video games. That's not really in line with the offence. In my opinion, it's another case of passing responsibility off to the government. Now, a couple of things. One, I promise you we didn't write those um, posts in defense of the um, bust. But also, I think what this kind of, you know, was it, neither side's probably 100% right. But I think what it shows undeniably is that there are still different opinions about cheats amongst, you know, amongst, I would assume, um, honest players. Now, the final reason, the final factor, I think, behind, um, you know, the sort of where, where we are with cheating at the moment is the is the, is frankly the speed um of uh the cheat industry um the you know the, 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 how quick they are to market if you like what this graph shows is um the noise around cheating in in the blue line cheat communities themselves so cheat forums and things and on the red line um regular player communities and it shows the noise as i said it shows the noise around cheating um, after a period, you know, when, when this game suddenly became massively popular last summer from pretty much from nowhere. And you can see that sort of week, you see the blue line in week four there suddenly starts to rise as cheat communities clock onto this game, start cheating it, start sharing cheats, start selling them. Only takes two weeks for that to start flowing through to the player communities to start complaining about the cheating on the game. And then you can see for the next few weeks how those lines correspond pretty closely there's a pretty close correlation there until um the complaints about cheating just go off the scale um as people just kind of frankly just you know, <laughs> you know just ditch it um and th by this stage it wasn't even just the player communities talking about cheating on the game it was all over the media as well um and it was a it was a well-acknowledged problem that this game had to sort it out and eventually they did um and you can you know you can still see the lines coming down now, as well as showing, I think, a strong correlation between, you know, what happens in the cheating communities having a knock-on effect in player communities, what this also shows is that how was shows how developers can get caught out and even established developers, because this was an established developer, but they didn't have anti-cheat set up for this game or proper anti-cheat processes and strategies, and the results are pretty clear to see. Now, what those factors um, combine to do is what we call is create what we call the um, anti-cheat game of whack-a-mole, where you know anti-cheat teams are kind of constantly trying to they're constantly running around trying to get to the next cheat, knock it on the head, reverse engineer it, and then they're off to another one, not knowing where the next one is going to come out. And it's amazing because we've spoken to lots of people in the industry and this analogy has come up so many times. We can't even claim it's original. So many people in the business refer to cheat, you know, dealing with cheating as like a game of whack-a-mole. And that's why we need to do things differently if we're going to get a hold of cheating and tackle cheating properly. Now, I was going to say some of you may remember this, but probably not. It was quite a long time ago, but I think some of you will recognize this. This is um, an athlete called Dick Fosbury competing at the 68 Mexico Olympics in the high jump, obviously. He won a gold medal. The interesting thing is he won this gold medal by doing the high jump in a completely new way. No one had done it this way before. Up until then, people did a kind of scissors approach or they rolled over it kind of on their side. But what Dick Fosbury realized is by going backwards, he could lift his legs higher 
and therefore clear a higher bar because the high jump is always about best pounding. It's always been about getting the legs over is the, is, the, is the tricky piece. Now, interestingly, at the time, everyone thought, "What's what's 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 this about? This is kind of this is this is this is crazy." But you know, obviously, now we all think they're crazy and that he's the sensible one. The interesting thing in this, though, is that he also was taking advantage of a technical development in the sport because up until then. People basically, they, the landing area was basically either sand or some old mattresses. And it was only at the 68 Olympics they brought in, um, you know, like full the full foam landing mats that you, that you see now today. So it's interesting that as well as his kind of, you know, um, his, 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 his sort of his, like um, the math that he used to work out, he could get his legs higher. There was also a he was also taking advantage of a technical change to the sport. And I think basically what this, you know, what this for me does is it says, what's our Fosbury flop? How are we going to disrupt how we tackle cheating in gaming in the same way that he disrupted how you did high jump? And for us, the Fosbury flop, the equivalent in gaming, is how we find cheats, where we look for them and how and where and, ha- and how we find them um, in order to get to them before they impact the game. It's about going to where the cheats are, going to where the cheats are marketed, YouTube in this case, going to where they're discussed. So, you know, whether that's Telegram, Twitter, Reddit, Discord, and of course, going to where they're sold. Um, you know, whether it's I want cheats, no, please note bottom right, the visa logo there, which is, you know, not a plant that is, that's genuine. But actually, I think what's interesting with this site is look how professional it's looking. I mean, that does not look like a dodgy site. GamePron, another one. Omega cheats and private cheats. And these are just four, these are just four sites out of those, that 150, um, I mentioned to you earlier. Um, so, you know, really just not even the tip of, not even the tip of the iceberg, but you can already see by going to where they're sold, where they're discussed and where they're, uh, marketed, you can imagine that's going to be a lot of data coming in. And, you know, I mentioned the 150 sites that we're, we're monitoring. We've also, um, as you know, in amongst that, we reckon at the moment we are somewhere north of 25,000 different cheat products that we found. Again, we know that that number is definitely going to get larger, but it gives you an idea of how much data there is out there um, around the whole, you know, the whole cheating space. Now, the question is, how, what can you do with that? How do you manage to find, how do you control, how do you pull that data in, in a useful way? And that's why we've created in Talker, and we've specifically um, why we've created a tech stack, which is made up of custom uh, collectors and crawlers to go out there and effectively monitor the dark web, the web, and social media twenty four seven, looking at places like you know Discord, Reddit, Telegram, all the cheap sites, YouTube, and indeed the dark web as well. And take all that data and ingest all that data and then tidy it, categorize it by community and measure and evaluate it to kind of to prioritize the prioritize by risk for different teams, whether that's legal, game security or player support, because all the, those are what we see as the three key te- you know, three teams that are going to um, most, you know, most benefit from this sort of data. But so those teams can take affirmative action quicker than they can today. So if you're a legal team, you can do a takedown much quicker. So if you're a game security team, you can start reverse engineering against the cheat much, much quicker. And then if you're a player support, you can, you know, you can proactively go out to your community and highlight a risk, for example. So we have this text that which pulls in this massive amount, or rather pulls out of this massive amount of data, relevant information to, um, to, 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 to start acting on cheats and taking action against cheats much, much earlier. So we're no longer waiting for the cheats to impact the game. 
and we're no longer w- relying on effectively manual research, which we know lots of the developers and indeed some of the anti-cheat firms, um, the, the, the anti-cheat firms also currently rely on. And as you can see from that amount of data, or the only, you know, automating, automated monitoring is the only way through. That is, if you like, automated monitoring is our Fosbury flop. So let's just have a look at what that looks like in action. I'll show you how it moves and I'll show, 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 show an animation in a second. Um, but this is, um, this is effectively the heart of the Intalker platform. These are what we call boards. And these present all the data that um, any searches you set up find. So what I mean by search is if you're, if you're, if you're using Intalker, you can set up various searches using our tag system. So you can search on by, you can search by game, you know, Apex Legends. You can search by um, type of site. So you can just go for cheap vendors or you could, you could be looking, you could be more interested in, um, you know, Reddit posts or YouTube, um, films. So you can do, or you can all search actually by cheat, cheat type. So by aimbots, for example. And you set up all these searches and that data is pulled in in real time and presented on a board like this. And I'm going to quickly show you, I said that animation, it's a GIF really. Um, I'm going to show you something, which will show you someone using this. And effectively, what I'd like you to sort of look for is how quickly you can go from effectively looking at first person shooter genre board to looking at a specific game, to looking at a specific cheat, and then actually being in a position to download and start taking action against that cheat. So you can see within just a few clicks, we've gone from looking at all the latest cheats for sale, cheats being spoken about um, across first person shooters to finding the latest aimbot available for CSGO. So you, you can see immediately how we're ingesting all that data and presenting it in a way that is usable. Now, talking of usability, you know, we are firm believers that data is only valuable if it gets used, you know, too often everyone talks about having lots of data, but if you're not using it, it's a, it's, 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 it's effectively meaningless, which is why for us, comprehension and shareability um, are absolutely key for what we do. And as a result of that, we use a cluster analysis tool to make this data even easier to, um, to uh, share with people within a business, but most importantly, make, make it easier to see where the real threats are coming from. Um, because obviously this is <laughs> just looking at words can be, can be quite hard to do that. So what we've done is cr- using this cluster analysis tool made it so that you can very quickly see what the biggest threats are um, for any game that you potentially will be interested in. Again, I'll show you a little film of someone doing, using our cluster analysis tool. So very quick. There you go. Let's play it again unless I stop it. So that there you go. Now, the other thing we wanted to be able to do is make sure our data can be integrated very quickly. So we've included um, the, through our APIs. You can set up alerts um, so that any information that Intalker pulls in can be integrated into any internal um, system um, just to make it that much quicker to be able to take action. And then finally, the final stage of the little demo bit of this presentation, I wanted to talk about our crawler because obviously this is all about the data that we're crawling. Now, when we crawl a site, we're pulling in something like 50 different data points um, 
behind that site. You know, it could be it could be who's provide who, who where, what sort of cyber security it has, what payment providers, the ISP, etc. It's just all the all the information about that site. But it, and very interesting, and I mentioned this right at the beginning of the presentation in terms of these third party providers, because we're pulling in all this data, we can see which third party providers are being used by these um, cheat sellers. And what that enables us to do is, as you can kind of see here, we can see, for example, that payment providers for this site, gameb2c.com, included PayPal, School, Western Union, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we're doing for one of our clients at the moment, or rather what they're doing with the information we give them, is they're putting pressure on these cheap, on, on the likes of PayPal and Skrill, basically saying you shouldn't be working with these guys. And as a result of that, at the very least, the, the payment brands, for example, in this case, are no longer working with them. But actually what's happening as well is these sites, because we're disrupting them so much, they close. And even just in the last couple of months, we've seen something like eight different sites completely close um, as a result of this pressure that we're putting on their third party Providers, so you know a direct result of this of using this data. So, what does this all mean? Well, we think it helps publishers and developers monitor more, more cheats, more sellers, more forums, you know, more, just more cheating in general. Um, but importantly, they can do this spending less um, financially. Yeah, you know, they no longer have to rely on throwing man hours um at you know at, at res researching cheats out there um which let's be honest most developers a don't want to do and b can't afford to do it also means they can act faster and act smarter you know you've seen how quickly we can pull this data in and you can imagine that data can be very quickly used to take legal action to start reverse engineering um or you know managing from a player support point of view it also means acting smarter because we're looking at the whole cheating, if you like, ecosystem and all the cheating that's out there, we can see um, when we can actually evaluate the anti-cheat action you're taking. We can sort of see how the level of cheating may be going down on a particular game versus um, other games in that market. So as opposed to a market effect thing, making us think, oh, we're doing really well. No, we can kind of take that out and actually say, no, this anti-cheat that you know strategy that you're doing is definitely working. It also means, as I mentioned earlier, by see, with using the clusters, you can prioritize your resource and action. You can see where the biggest threats are coming from rather than effectively having to guess. And finally, this, is mean, this means you've got happier players. There is less complaining, which means they're less pissed off, um, which in turn should mean your colleagues, in particular players supporting community management, are also happier. But also because they've got the they've got more tools now, so that if players are complaining, the player support people managing those problems will have much more data than they've had in the past, and will know more about what steps are being taken to combat it. And I think that's really important because you know if that if we can help those people spend less time worrying about cheating or having to deal with people worrying about cheating, that means they can spend more time dealing with these other issues which takes us back to the framework. You know, they can spend more time dealing with harassment, dangerous speech, antisocial actions, and that can only be a good thing. Now, I'm not for a minute going to sit here and say, we can eradicate cheating. There will always be people trying to make a buck from it. There will always be people who want to get one over. It's just, it's kind of, it's, 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 the, way, it's the way of the world. But what we can do is we can reduce it and we can, <laughs> disrupt the cheating business model and the cheating ecosystem so that there is less of it. And we feel that is really important. And that would itself be a big step. And I think I want to finish with some words from the um, framework itself, which I think brings to life why it's important, why we love gaming. With the advent of reliable in-home networks and other technologies, online multiplayer games have become an ingrained part of our social tapestry. They enable us to make friends and escape the monotony and stresses of everyday life. Games bring people together through the power of shared experience. We can fight alien invaders, explore distant lands, plant a garden or push each other in a shopping cart. At their best, games reflect the peak of humanity collaborating with one another across what might otherwise be vast divides. Anyone can belong in a game, no matter where they are in the world or if they never leave their home. Thank you.